welcome everybody to today's Jure Fix, which is not a usual Jure Fix because uh, normally at this uh, at this time of the day on a Monday we would have an internal meeting um, discussing internal affairs, so to speak. But today this is different. Today um, we have invited all of you who are here who are not um, part of Ritzit, but who are interested in um, today's presentation, which is um, a book presentation by our dear colleague Goran Music, um, who will present his book entitled Making and Breaking the Yugoslav Working Class, which um, has just come out with uh, CEU Press in Budapest. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to to see Goran presenting this book here, um, given that I was actually there when he presented the project for the first time at, um, at his alma mater at the European University Institute in Florence, where he where this um, was his PhD. And I also did my PhD there. Um, and I started a year before. And in Florence, there's this ritual of first year presentations where the rookies, so to speak, have to present their work and the professors come and listen, and some of the more uh, more advanced PhD students also come in and listen to see um, what the new folks uh, have to present. So um, that was uh, 13 years ago, I believe, um, more or less, give or take. Um, today we are here to um, well to look to listen to Goran present the final product. Um, a published book, a book which um, which he frames um, as a part of a broader attempt to bring class and labor back into history, one could say, and notably not just any class, but the working class, uh, which was the alleged bearer of socialism, but which um, for some reason, well, for quite um, easily identifiable reasons, disappeared from the radar of historiography for a while when socialism disappeared. And um, well, part of the reason was perhaps that the whole class paradigm seemed somewhat discredited with the end of socialism. But in the particular case of Yugoslavia, there was of course the additional factor that uh, nationalism and the national factor just overshadowed everything in the analysis of uh, Yugoslav history, also in retrospect. So essentially, the history of post-war Yugoslavia was reframed and retold as a story of ethnic strife, or at the very least, people were looking for the seeds of this ethnic furor and the, the horrible wars and violence that we saw in the 1990s. Um, and many people forgot something that Goran reminds us of in this book, and very forcefully reminds us that um, Yugoslavia and Yugoslav socialism was actually a fascinating case for observers, for contemporary observers in the 1960s, 1970s, um, precisely because of its peculiar and particular approach to socialism, which was different from all the other socialism, uh, socialist states. And uh, that was this quite famous at the time um, approach called worker self-management, um, in wh which was a conscious alternative to the top-down socialism um, implemented in, in more openly Stalinist countries. Um, so it was it was a a way to sort of get the wor the working class involved in the organization of labor. But it was also, um, and this is an important point that Goran makes, um, it was also seen as a way to build an industrial proletariat. Um, so basically to, yeah, to create a working class in the first place. Um, and what Goran presents here in this book are, and what he's going to present today, um, I believe in his, in his presentation that, we'll, that he will give, are the ambivalent outcomes of this project. Um, I mean, obviously, he cannot escape the fact that Yugoslavia did disappear in the end, and that no worker self-management and no Bratstvo Yudinstvo ideology could save it. But this, and this is important to stress over and over, and this is also part of the, part of the narrative of the book, this is not a teleolog teleological story. 
Um, but what we need and what Goran is doing here is to attempt and understand Yugoslav history and Yugoslav working class history on its own terms. And this is what this book does, the way I understand it. It is a micro history of class formation, as Goran puts it, um, arcing back to E.P. Thompson, um, a class formation that remained incomplete, incomplete in many ways. Um, spoiler alert, perhaps, but uh, not, not taken away too much from, uh, from, from your presentation. It remained incomplete in many ways, but um, at the same time, the project as such inspired the hearts and minds of many people, and it also shaped the lives of many people over quite a long time. And um, it is certainly the merit of Goran's book that he's um, bringing these stories to light. Um, and now, without further ado, I will um, give the floor to the author to tell us about the making and breaking of the Yugoslav working class um, and tell us the story of two self-managed factories in Slovenia and in Serbia. So Goran, please. Okay, thank you, Yanis. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, as you mentioned in the opening remarks, it feels a bit of, in, in a way, coming full circle. So uh, Yanis was actually the first colleague to give comments on this project in the very early days, some um, 11 years ago, when it was still a, just an idea a project in the making. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was very encouraging. Uh, you know, it, it was very, very uh, an encouraging comment from a colleague. And I kind of kept it in my mind, uh, you know, throughout the previous years, I remember vividly, uh, uh, you know, this uh, opening round uh, in, in Florence. So um, it feels only right to start, uh, you know, promoting the book now that the, the, the project is finished and I can finally um, launch it and present it um, to the outside world. It feels only right that I start here with Yanis as, um, you know, the moderator. Um, but before we, you know, become too sentimental, uh, we have some some work ahead of us. So let's let's start with with the presentation. Um, so let me start by uh, saying a few words about, you know, uh, how I approach this topic and what um, led me led me uh, uh, into it. So um, let me see just if this um, presentation can move on from the first slide. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, what became clear to me early on when, when thinking about this, this uh, project is how little we know about the people who were supposedly the ruling class in uh, socialist uh, Yugoslavia. And in the meantime, in the previous decade, there have been, you know, uh, some excellent publications, many people um, studying social inequalities, class and labor in former Yugoslavia. Uh, I don't have time to, to go into all of them, uh, to, to mention all of these names, but, you know, uh, up until today, uh, the term working class remains loaded with ideological connotations that were widely used by elites in socialist and post-socialist um, years to justify the existing hierarchies. Uh, so on the one hand, you find this uh, cliche of a heroic, you know, inherently progressive, politically conscious uh, working class. And the flip side of this uh, picture is an easily manipulated, uneducated, backward, still have peasant social layer which slows down reforms in socialism, which somehow serves as an obstacle to a faster Europeanization in post-socialist years and so on. So these cliches, uh, you know, uh, dominate, still dominate popular discourse in uh, former Yugoslavia, but they have also clearly influenced uh, academic production um, as well. So instead of uh, measuring Yugoslav labor against a kind of a ready-made uh, definition, 
Um, the book chooses, as Yanis mentions, a kind of Thompsonian approach of creation or quote unquote making of the working class on the ground, searching for ways in which um, Yugoslav workers perceive themselves in relation to other social layers. So I looked at the actual makeup of uh, working class between the end of the Second World War and the late 1980s, uh, trying to uh, see what categories dominated um, uh, workers' descriptions of their immediate environment. And I was also interested, of course, in the state of these particular um, institutions of workers' self-management, right? The altering nature of power relations inside of them. So one of the main questions was how did different occupational groups um, in the factory um, interpret the recurring crisis of uh, Yugoslav socialism? And how did they appropriate uh, the official ideology from their own uh, particular position? Right, so trying to see them as agents on their own, uh, rather than just passive recipients of ideas from above. And the way to do this was uh, to conduct a microhistorical research of concrete um, enterprises to factories. Uh, so I have a factory as a level of analysis, and I follow development of uh, these two case studies through different historical conjunctions different phases of Yugoslav uh, uh, socialism. Uh, you know, so the two case studies are uh, EMR, Industria Motora Rakovica, and TAM, Tovarna Automobil Maribor. EMR was an engine and tractor factory located in Rakovica, a suburb of, uh, of uh, Belgrade, whereas TAM uh, was also part of Yugoslav automotive um, uh, uh, industry but it was a final producer of trucks and uh, buses. So these were two quite large factories for Yugoslav standards. Uh, EMR employed around 6,000 workers uh, at the most, TAM up to eight, 9,000. Uh, and they were in a sense exceptional in the sense that, as I said, they were large, uh, they um, employed mostly male workers, uh, they had employed a lot of highly skilled metal workers. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, they are large enough and they had self-management and political structures which were developed enough for them to reflect some of the main tendencies uh, within uh, the Yugoslav industrial milieu over, over decades. And an interesting thing with them is also that they were connected within the production chain, right? So EMR, the Rakovica factory, produced engines, which were then sent to Maribor, to TAM. Uh, so they were connected uh, uh, in, uh, in a business way. So it was interesting to see how this um, relation evolved over, over years. And last but not least, both of these um, municipalities uh, of these factories were uh, sites of large strikes in the late 1980s, uh, most notably in uh, summer and autumn of 1988. Uh, one of them, uh, the strike of um, Rakovica workers in, uh, in the center of Belgrade in October of 1988, became kind of parad paradigmatic of uh, these things uh, that we talked about, this uh, superfluous view of um, uh, the role of labor in those years. So there is this famous saying, uh, which refers uh, to this strike, and it goes uh, something along the lines of they came as workers and returned as Serbs. Uh, so the workers allegedly came in the militant mood, armed with the social demands, only to cancel strike action after hearing a speech delivered to them by um, Slobodan Milosevic, the leader of the Serbian League of Communists, the Serbian Communist Party at uh, the time. So this uh, account became a kind of a common wisdom in Serbia and, and broader in, in the region uh, over, over time. And it blocks, in, in, in my view, kind of deeper investigation into the role of labor um, in these crucial years. And it implies that the workers were somehow inherently responsive to strong authoritative leadership and that they were attracted to nationalism through 
primordial allegiances, right? So uh, when, you know, one of the main ideas of the book is really to explain this, uh, this, this process. So uh, the main thing that one needs to, uh, so these are just uh, pictures of these two events in, in Maribor in the summer of um, 1988, and then um, the Rakovica workers in um, the federal parliament um, on October 4th, 1988. And you can see Milosevic uh, addressing them from the podium. <clears throat> so the, 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 the main um, thing that one needs to unpack when talking about uh, Yugoslavia and, 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 and working class is this block concept of workers' self-management, of course, right? So the first impulse that you know, one has when looking at, looking at it is that one tends to see it as the mechanism of workers' power in the economic and even political sphere, right? The kind of idea of a conscious control over the economy and society by the working class, referring to the Russian Revolution, uh, you know, the experience of workers' councils, um, and so on. And in the Yugoslav case, what I argue is that um, uh, this is somewhat misleading. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that the concept could not uh, gain such connotations uh, uh, on the ground, but for most of the time, it meant something quite different within Yugoslav socialism. So it was understood as the right of workers of a single work collective to control the income created within their enterprise. So it implied that workers should have at their disposal all of the value they create, not as a class, but as a work collective, as a factory. And also reverse logic followed. And it implied that nobody should spend beyond their limits, right? Meaning appropriate income that they did not earn as this would amount to a kind of exploitation. So in the early 1950s, after years of trying to industrialize through you know, political mobilizations, um, you know, notions of heroic work, the Yugoslav Communist Party openly stated that the maximization of income is the prime motivator of uh, uh, workers' efforts and overall economic growth. So workers should be motivated to, uh, you know, by growing opportunities to consume, uh, 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 but at the same time, they should exercise self-control, uh, meaning not spend over their means. So the introduction of worker self-management was a way to release the productive powers uh, you know, of uh, this quote unquote homo economicus as copied from the neoclassical economics. And at the same time, you know, collective discussions and persuasions inside the organs of self-management were supposed to keep wage hikes in line with uh, advances in productivity. So workers' self-management could be seen as a Yugoslav formula of squaring the circle of you know, uh, Cold War development dilemmas. It allowed for state control over the economy and high investments, while at the same time combating you know, low work motivation, wastage, and this you know, infamous idea of soft budget constraints uh, faced by many countries in the, in the Soviet bloc. And conversely, <clears throat> it introduced commodity exchange, market incentives for uh, economic growth, while avoiding the rise of private owners of capital and capitalist uh, exploitation. So this economic model often referred to as market socialism proved successful, uh, quite successful for, for, for some time in stimulating um, economic growth and development, but it also created many contradictions. And one of the you know, main was unequal development. So there were discrepancies between different enterprises, between different regions, there was, you know, relatively high unemployment, uh, and you know, overall social inequalities, which were considered unacceptable for a country which considers itself to be socialist. Um, so the second uh, main um, uh, idea that I, I, I work with is this differentiation between productive and non-productive um, um, value, right? So. 
uh, I found that one of the pillars of workers uh, uh, self identification um, was the specific understanding of work, or to be more precise, the strict uh, differentiation between productive and unproductive work. So like other socialist countries, the Yugoslav party state kept a clear distinction between direct production on the one hand um, and administration on the other in order to keep you know, a check on red tape and bureaucracy. And the inspiration for this division was, of course, um, the labor theory of value, but in a quite vulgarized uh, way. Uh, the manual workers uh, then appropriated and internalized uh, these workerist interpretations of uh, labor, according to which, quote unquote, true uh, work or the type of work which produces uh, surplus value was restricted to uh, strenuous, uh, manual, uh, masculine, you know, physical work behind the machine uh, in, in the industry. And all other professions allegedly lived off of the value uh, produced by manual uh, workers. So inside the factories, um, shop floor workers, those who were paid by piece rates, um, identify themselves commonly as a group very much in contrast uh, to those who were paid by the hour, right? So uh, white collar workers, uh, professional management, but also, um, you know, political bureaucracy. <clears throat> so here you can see some of the um, um, comics from the factory papers of these two factories which uh, depict um, these, these, these divisions. Um, so, you know, you have workers carrying these loads on their backs, right? Of the burden of bureaucracy, whether it's administration, one of them even says culture. Um, on the other hand, you have presentations of uh, white collar or desk workers and they are, uh, you know, depicted as, um, quite uh, lethargic, uh, you know, uh, not working very much, um, close inside their offices, being afraid of manual workers, and so on, right? So you can clearly see these, these, these uh, presentations. However, uh, manual workers could have also been perceived as non-productive. Uh, so here you see some of the um, uh, comics which, uh, you know, present industrial direct production workers in this light. So they're seen as, you know, um, uh, sitting idle, uh, reading comic books next to the machines, uh, you know, chatting, uh, being lazy, or, you know, just being plain infantile, childlike, uh, right? And this could have been a vision of productive workers as seen from the desk offices, right? From the, the, the white collar workers, uh, but it could also be an image of workers uh, shared on the shop floor as they, uh, you know, if they uh, were observing uh, another factory, which is less productive or needs uh, state help, uh, right? Or a rival factory or so on. So this was also one of the uh, widespread tropes uh, on, on, on the shop floors in, in Yugoslav factories. And uh, the best way to, uh, you know, to, to describe this and to present it is this idea of bureaucracy, right? So many workers in self-managed factories um, felt disadvantaged or even outright exploited. But, you know, the question is who did they perceive as their main adversary in a self-management uh, system? So this ambiguous term bureaucracy um, and its many variations um, illustrates how the perceived adversary uh, you know, uh, of the working class could have been different you know, in a particular factory, uh, in a particular moment of uh, time. So the first notion of bureaucracy is of course the political bureaucracy, right? The party state, bureaucratia. And, you know, it refers to, you know, people who do not have any direct role in economy, in the production process, they simply administrate uh, from above. And in a self-managed society, 
um, you know, this was seen as something which should wither away with time, this layer of, of, of uh, 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 political bureaucracy, right? But the state was so highly decentralized in, in Yugoslavia that it was often hard to um, pin down which part of the party state, you know, they are talking about or should be um, seen as, as, as troublesome, whether it's, you know, the federal party state, uh, the level of republics, the communal municipal level or the autonomous republics even. So this complicated things, this decentralization of the Yugoslav political system quite a bit. The second uh, most commonly used uh, notion of bureaucracy is this idea of technocracy or technobureaucratia. And it refers to professional management uh, within the factory and the various experts which were employed uh, by these uh, enterprises. However, uh, workers in uh, Yugoslav industry um, uh, chose their management and they co-managed right through, right through the, the, the organs of self-management. So it was very hard also to have a clear cut and place all the burden on um, the management. Uh, uh, and the third um, uh, group to which this uh, term could be applied was administration or white collar workers uh, uh, in, in the factory, the so-called regia uh, in, in Serbo-Croatian. And these were, as I explained, the white collar workers of one's own uh, enterprise who allegedly do not produce uh, value. However, uh, the term bureaucracy or the connotations of bureaucracy could be applied to other workers uh, as well, or in, in the sense of those who are ally, allied or allies of bureaucracy or benefiting from the bureaucratic uh, system of relations. So the, this could be workers in rival companies or other regions that allegedly earn income not through honest work, but you know political favoring, uh, bureaucratic manipulation, and so on. So class alliances in a Yugoslav uh, industry were very complex and they shifted over time, right? Workers in different factories and even different layers of workers in, in a single factory um, were uh, constantly tempted to shift allegiances and seek for different um, uh, solutions. So for instance, they could opt for what is often referred to as uh, micro corporatism, meaning reliance on strong paternalistic management uh, and thus demand more business freedoms uh, in relation uh, to, to, uh, to the state, right? Um, conversely, they could orient towards the factory communists uh, or direct communication with the political leadership to put pressure on the local management and to regulate um, business agreements through uh, the state and political um, negotiation, right? And the key person who um, presided over these often conflicting uh, tendencies was, of course, um, Josip Broz uh, Tito. So Tito's uh, support brought political legitimacy and it also safeguarded from the potential state repression. And Tito was not simply a symbol of the party state. He escaped officially sanctioned um, presentations and was seen as a figure standing above the bureaucracy, right? Engaging in a direct non-institutional contact with workers and various social movements uh, in uh, Yugoslavia at the time. So looking at the, the factory level, uh, one sees that what is often referred to as the cult of personality, Tito's cult of personality had a life of its own, uh, right? Apart from this officially state organized uh, pageantry, right? So Tito's image was kept alive um, through numerous insider stories, firsthand accounts, uh, you know, personal reminiscences, uh, factory myths circulating on the shop floors. And these stories were usually passed from older to younger uh, 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 workers. Uh, and you know, I describe many of, of, of these stories uh, in, in my book, but probably one of my favorite genres, so to say, are these 
surprise um, uh, visits of Tito, these unofficial visits where he suddenly appears on the shop floor without any official um, visit, without the managers or the party knowing about this. So, you know, Tito would just, especially in Rakovica, which is uh, positioned very close to um, Dedinje, another Belgrade neighborhood, which hosted all the, you know, the institutions and Tito's um, uh, Beli Dvor, uh, his residence. Uh, these type of stories circulated the ideas that, you know, Tito would appear uh, in the second or even third shift, uh, that he would be uh, incognito there and that he would engage in conversations with workers, hearing about, you know, the conditions of work, what the machines are like, you know, and understanding workers uh, uh, fully. And Tito was, of course, in the interwar period, he was working partly as, as a metal worker. So this image of Tito behind the, you know, the machine um, was quite also widespread. It was, you know, reproduced uh, in the factories quite, quite often. So the industrial workers believed that they had an ally at the very top of the Yugoslav party state. And this conviction uh, encouraged them to stand up and raise concerns more confidently, right? So what happens in uh, the course of the 1980s when um, Tito dies and when there is a prolonged economic and political crisis in the country is that there is a growing frustration of the industrial workers who feel their voice is no longer reaching the political the political leaderships and the outbreak of you know there's an outbreak of strikes of street protests of blue collar workers across uh, the country in the second half of uh, the decade and the two uh, actors that step in to communicate with workers grievances uh, uh, in these years are the enterprise managers and the Republican uh, leaderships. So in a situation, and in a situation when there is no longer a kind of a unifying um, symbol for the Yugoslav working class, uh, when there is no grand coalition between uh, workers and Tito, which sandwiches you know, political bureaucracies and managers uh, uh, inside of a all Yugoslav federal frame, uh, these new actors uh, start popularizing the idea of uh, other workers, workers in other enterprises, workers in other parts of the country, as allies of the bureaucracies, of someone who is partly to blame for um, the crisis which is uh, 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 taking place. So, for instance, in um, Slovenia, in, in Maribor, uh, TAMS uh, management, uh, you know, throughout the 80s, starts in a very subtle way, launching a kind of nationalist colored language, which criticizes its suppliers down the chain uh, from the Southern uh, Republics, right, for, uh, you know, being not sending their um, uh, shipments on time, for allegedly blackmailing them with prices in, you know, inflationary uh, situation. It uh, starts criticizing solidarity transfers to underdeveloped regions uh, in uh, southeast uh, regions and kind of re really warns wor its own workforce against any type of centrally steered effort to reform um, uh, the, the economic system. And this, was, this would allegedly go um, to, um, not to their benefit. Um, and in Serbia, the reformist wing of uh, the League of Communists, personified by Slobodan Milosevic, spreads this idea of a, uh, a radical central decentralization of Yugoslavia as the main cause for the proliferation of bureaucracy, right? And you know this demands a stronger political influence of Serbia to re-centralize um, the country. And over time, this movement called the uh, anti-bureaucratic revolution gains increasingly chauvinist overtones in um, late 1988-89 and uh, EMR, Industria Motora Rakovica, ultimately joins these uh, top-down um, uh, rallies, giving it kind of a blue-collar credential, right? So by 1989, what we see is that the managements of these two factories 
and their self-management organs ally completely with their uh, respective political leaderships, arguing, uh, you know, accusing each other of bureaucratic manipulations, of using unfair advantages uh, in you know, doing business, and they invoke you know, alleged historical injustices, right? So for instance, in Serbia, there was this insistence that the industrial facilities were transferred from Serbia to Slovenia by political decisions after World War II. And you know, there, this idea starts gaining ground that um, uh, the position of EMR within the production chain and uh, you know, its uh, economic difficulties were somehow uh, due to this historical injustice that the truck production was uh, transferred from Rakovica to Slovenia um, in the you know, uh, uh, early years after uh, World War uh, II. So my idea was with, with this book was uh, you know not to negate these um, uh, alliances which started to take shape by the late 1980s between these um, you know nationalist elites and parts of the working class, but rather to explain how this process um, took place and who was you know res responsive to these types of messages. So what I show is that. First of all, this did not happen overnight, that this was a prolonged process, which you know, takes place throughout the 1980s. Um, and I also show how much uh, you know, these elites had to, um, you know, uh, 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 to come to terms with discussions which took place inside the industry, mostly along the lines that I described of productive, unproductive labor bureaucracy and adjust their message uh, and give ground to uh, workers' grievances in order to get a hearing for uh, their new um, agendas. What I also show is that there was you know, differentiation in different layers of blue collar workers uh, in terms of how responsive they were to this new language of nationalism. So I clearly show that it was mostly um, younger workers who did not have this experience of um, 1950s, 1960s, uh, of you know integral economic development did not you know have much weaker connections to the Second World War and the partisan movement, um, and also how these messages were picked up uh, mostly by um, political activists who were uh, in the lower ranks of um, uh, the local factories. So they were trying to use these new uh, political messages to kick out kind of the, the veteran older um, cadres within the party and the self-management uh, uh, organs. So, uh, you know, I tried to explain this process, but what I also am really careful about describing are these autonomous um, initiatives on the ground. So this lack of central authority in the 1980s also enable development of independent uh, class initiatives of Yugoslav workers. And uh, you know, I dedicate most space to this municipal trade union um, initiative in Rakovica, which formulated its own blue collar platform independent of the official state union and parallel to these top down mobilizations of the Serbian party for a couple of months in um, 1988. And uh, the second one is, as I mentioned, this, this wildcat strike of Maribor workers in the summer of 1988, where workers from TAM, but also uh, all other uh, industrial facilities in Maribor blocked the entire city for three days um, in a kind of a uh, uh, de facto uh, general strike, uh, spreading fear in the media and in the Slovene party that these strikes might give rise to a new populist um, figure who could reverse the reforms of the pro-market reforms of the 1980s, right? So even though these initiatives were rather short-lived, uh, you know, uh, and they were eventually co-opted by the political elites or uh, the factory management, I think it is important to show how things were not set in stone, right? That there were these opposing options and ideas existing on the ground side by side. And by recognizing this plurality of platforms, of agents, as well as the levels of contingency present in those uh, events, 
right? The book hopefully um, contributes to transforming this image of Yugoslav socialism, you know, away from this idea of a dark tunnel, which inevitably leads to disaster, to a more open-ended process, which encompasses right different possibilities. So I think I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. So we can, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to all your questions and comments. Well, thank you very much, Goran, for uh, this presentation of your work and of your findings. Um, perhaps you could end the, uh, the screen share now. So we, um, Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, now the procedure we have is that um, whoever wants to ask a question, make a comment, just writes a plus sign in the chat and um, I will then call you up. So um, please, uh, do we have any instant reactions? comments, questions to the author, praise, words of praise, or so. Yes, Anastasia, please. Come on, somebody has to start it. Thank you so much for uh, this fascinating, quite fascinating talk. And I think I will start with a very brief and rather slightly related question and if there is an opportunity I will ask a more profound one uh, later. The thing uh, that probably smoothens us also into the discussion too is that my personal appraisal to that amount of those satirical depictions of um, workers for I presume this public discourse on working class is well, probably not completely underrepresented issue in the state socialism countries, but there is definitely much to be done on that. And um, from a different angle, from my own research in the Soviets, I recently came across with quite an interesting bias, considering uh, the depiction of, well, as the matter of fact, nobody should be should wonder, of, of course, that there is a particular bias how you set how, how you depict the satire about uh, misconceptions, misconducts, and failures of the planned economy, which is definitely far more planned in the Soviet Union than uh, in the case of Yugoslavia. Still, I had an impression that uh, the same thing follows uh, the depictions that you showed us. So uh, the Soviet example was that you criticize the bottom level uh, and never go up beyond a certain level of bureaucracy. So you can do medium level bureaucra bureaucrats, precisely those technocrats, uh, but it is never contesting the upper level. And this is where it probably joined very well to your depiction of uh, this image of Tito. Uh, could you possibly comment on certain regularities or probably like the satire, how you, how you satirize the uh, Yugoslav worker? Thank you so much, by the way. Okay, should, should I proceed directly to, to answer? Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anastasia, for this. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. This is a phenomenon which, um, you know, relates to um, all or, you know, many, many former socialist countries and their industry, as far as I've seen. It's this um, comics, caricatures, or satire as a way to express certain criticism, dissatisfaction, certain neurological, you know, issues which existed but were not you know able to 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 freely or you know to, to maximum extent raise in in public quite quite openly and as such they are very valuable source um, for my work and many other uh, historians dealing with labor uh, in former Yugoslavia so most of the factory journals uh, had these type of funny comics uh, on their pages, and they circulated also uh, in you know the the press. And sometimes they would pick up um, these images from the press, from the the, the mainstream media, 
Sometimes they would exchange them between themselves, between factories. There were some, you know, tropes which, um, you know, cup come across all, all the time. And sometimes, very rarely, but, you know, I enjoy these the most, there were these, uh, uh, you know, naive depictions which were drawn by the workers themselves, right? So uh, most of these comics were done by kind of professional, you know, uh, drawers or illustrators. But there are also sometimes these naive pictures which workers themselves send to the factory paper and then they uh, then they uh, uh, publish them. Um, and you know as as far as uh, new uh, opportunities that workers had to to you know express through them, I guess you know the the the, the level the freedom of criticism was I would I would say much greater than in 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 many other um, you know countries in the Soviet uh, bloc, but still there were these you know sensitive issues. Uh, you know, maybe not political, but things such as, you know, gender relations within the factory, you know, uh, um, family life, um, theft, for instance, uh, you know, um, uh, low, low productivity, um, you know, these everyday type of things which did not have a place in these official ideologized or highly, uh, you know, uh, uh, reports which were based on you know economical performance or political um, mobilizations um, and in terms of who is um, targeted i would say you know because of this you know situation of self-management and this connection that i described this grand coalition between the workers and tito actually uh, you know uh, managers and kind of you know experts people with positions are openly criticized. You know, they're pretty fair game, uh, so to say, right? Um, so this appears quite commonly, this uh, idea of a bureaucracy, and usually it is uh, referred to, you know, the, the inside of the factory, this white collar professional staff. However, as I explained, there is, you know, they, they listen tentatively to the messages from the party and the trade union. So in relation to, you know, if, the you know the, the the emphasis is on techno bureaucracy or on bureaucracy you can kind of then orient and you know target your criticism more towards the you know political leadership in your republic or municipality or remain within the factory so there is like you know a very very fine tuning that you have to read uh, there and that you know the you know, workers who were active politically and within self management organs were able to read and 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 see and then again vice versa you know there was this you know kind of um, heroic notion of working class which survived the 50s so it was quite you know politically incorrect to you know launch criticism of manual workers but then these comics as i showed gave you know desk workers and the management some relief and chance to also launch their own um, visions of what is wrong with the factory and you know, why is, you know productivity slowing down and so on. So it's it's really a a, a great source. Thank you very much for the question and the answer. Um, we will continue on the list with Paul Stubbs, please. Thanks. Hi, Goran. Congrats on the book. It's good to see you. Um, Thanks, Paul. Uh, not much was new, of course, but 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 what did strike me was, and Anastasia talked about this, the the role of Tito as arbiter. And I want to push you a bit on this because I don't know whether you've seen a recent text by Dejan Jovic where he analyzes letters of ordinary citizens to Tito. And he argues that this trope of Tito as arbiter was very contradictory because in the 70s, Tito had very little real power. And I've argued that that's why Tito's baby could be the non-aligned movement. But I wonder whether, you know, there's a parallel bit to this in terms of, you know, workers appealing to Tito as arbiter, but actually that not making very much difference. Right. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I remain very much on, on the factory, factory level. So I could not tell you what an effect this had on you know, the top echelons of the party state or how it changed from the 60s and the 70s once republics gain more power and you know, Tito becomes aging and right, less politically influential, perhaps in the party state. What I can tell you 
Um, looking at it from the shop floor um, perspective is that this, you know, authority and belief that, you know, um, Tito is still the one who is in charge um, and who can help them. This remains unshaken all the way up until the very end, meaning Tito's death in 1980. So what does change is this uh, difficulty of reaching Tito. They're very aware of this. So the intermediaries between them and Tito, you know, multiply over years as this bureaucracy multiplies, as the system becomes more complex, as the society becomes more uh, developed and complex and the economy. Uh, however, there is no, you know, grain of, 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 of suspicion of doubt that once their voice somehow reaches Tito, once they establish this um, non-institutional communication, that Tito would be on their side and that you know, things would then, all the pieces would fall um, into line in the sense that there is this, you know, the, the level of alienation is definitely not as high uh, as you know. If I get the impression of reading, you know, um, accounts of labor in Romania, in uh, you know, uh, other Soviet uh, states, in the sense that there is this feeling that, in the bottom line, um, you know, the system could be salvaged only if the genuine voice of the workers is recognized. And once it reaches Tito they are completely confident in their victory and they are sure that you know um, uh, their grievances will be fulfilled and 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 listened um so this is yeah this is this is this is the the, the the feeling that i have okay thank you um then we'll continue with our colleague lin nguyen Hello, I don't know why my camera isn't, okay, it's on now. So thank you so much, Goran, for this talk. Um, I, I have a question, it's actually more of a comment that I know might not directly uh, actually speak to your book, because as you said, you stick to the factory floor. But um, when I think about the self-management project, um, it was, there's something quite specific about it, because I know, because you talk about it more like in terms of like self-organization and economics, but it was a term that was extremely powerful and has this kind of intensive usage, for instance, in Poland by Lachosław Goździk, one of the first activists, and then by Kurań Modelewski when they wrote the open letter. So it was very much a political idea that kind of traveled within the social socialist bloc and push them to kind of make this kind of first open letter against the against the, um, the 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 communist party and they take their take on this Mozelewski and Kurong was very much to a total one so it was a critique of bureaucracy it was an economic analysis but it was foremost a social and political critique so in that sense, it, I think it's quite of a fascinating kind of transfer here of idea of, a, of an idea that led to action kind of unified for a short period of time, um, kind of a rather small but still workers milieu in Poland. But at the same time, so you have this, so what I'm trying to say here, this is some kind of a dilemma here or a paradox. So on the one hand, you have this kind of very intensified uh, usage of that term. On many, many different levels, but at the same at the same time, there is a there is some kind of a ephemerality to that uh, term, as it's kind of this uh, of its radical potential for kind of self-critical capacity of the Communist Party in the 1960s. No one would really work, think on those lines anymore. Actually, the dissidents were embarrassed that they ever embraced on that notion. So I was just wondering, is that really a question? If you could comment on that, of this kind of intensive. Um, um, you know, mobilizing power of that term and of the praxis. And at the same time, that was very ephemeral that the question is like, you know, should we still remember it and how? It, so there's a kind of, you know, ghost of failure behind it. So I was wondering if you could just comment on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what you refer to is, is very important. I think it really deserves um, additional uh, research is this, proliferation and transfer of the idea of worker self-management um, throughout uh, you know, Eastern Europe, but also Western Europe in the post-World um, post War II um, period. So, uh, you know, it definitely, the term does not have this, um, you know, oppositional um, radical um, um, power uh, that it again gains in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, um, you know, and even in France, in, in Germany during the 1960s, 1970s, uh, simply because in Yugoslavia, this is the ruling state um, ideology, 
right? So whereas, uh, you know, in uh, Poland, in France, you could, uh, you know, uh, apply it to a kind of autonomy, you know, gaining, fighting for more autonomy from the state in, you know, political, personal, economic um, uh, space, you know, fighting for this, you know, uh, uh, less alienation and kind of, you know, uh, a holistic um, uh, notions of uh, freedom. In Yugoslavia, it, it remains caught uh, in this usage of the party state. So it refers primarily uh, to uh, the economic sphere, the idea of workers uh, within uh, their factories. This is this is a very important thing that I that I stress is that self management is very much um, uh, stays encapsulated within the enterprise. This is the, the space where you uh, fulfill your self-management uh, rights. Um, this is where you practice it. And then there is, of course, um, you know, a, a, a struggle to um, overcome it. And in the 1970s, there is this very, very ambitious project, again, launched from, from, from the top called Associated Labor, which I describe in detail in the book of, inter of, of you know, positioning self-management as a kind of a holistic political and uh, social system. So implementing it on the level of, um, you know, municipality, uh, 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 you know, and uh, uh, kind of integrating it into the state structures uh, in order for the state to wither away, right? Um, however, you know, shortly after this idea uh, is implemented uh, institutionally, the crisis of the 1980s steps in, and these efforts lose political uh, backing. Um, when it comes to um, uh, memories uh, of worker self-management and the way it kind of lost its its you know um, political power and currency, I would say, you know, in in I mean, it it goes of course together with this um, notion that Yanis explained at the beginning of you know fall of um, uh, you know Fordism of um, for this uh, uh, modernization of the working class, of socialist projects, um, but it also kind of uh, you know in in in, um, in, in it, 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 because it it remains so vague uh, in these discussions being used you know to within Eastern Europe and Western Europe to to um, uh, win over any type of kind of autonomy in, re in relation to the states or the management. It's precisely because of this; it remained kind of vague and 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 you know disappeared in in thin uh, thin uh, air, or became uh, used in another direction. You know, launching kind of neoliberal reforms and more markets uh, right within um, the economy and the enterprise. This is another thread which is really interesting. And within Yugoslavia, there is this very fatalistic type of uh, um, you know idea of connecting then self-management to lags in uh, consciousness, right? Saying, you know, self-management is something great, you know, something uh, that we had, but we were not able to use it because we were not responsible enough. We were not, you know, politically conscious enough. So it was in a way ahead of its time, right? This is the kind of notion that you encounter often, right? So, you know, it was a great idea, um, however, we were not up to the historical task of using it, and it created more harm than good in the last instance because of this, exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, I put myself on the list next, um, but please, everyone else, also feel free um, to join the speaker's list. Um, so, Goran, I have two questions, I guess, at this point. Um, one has to do with um, with your object of study. You, you yourself say that these factories are in are not representative in many ways. They're special cases. Um, at the same time, they are sort of they are. Um, oh, I mean, they're interesting for that reason. Um, they are located in, well, one is located in the, in the center of power, so to speak, in Serbia, like literally close to power, um, and also in the, in the capital that's both 
well, both the capital of the, of the federal state, but also of the Republic of Serbia, which has increasing ambition to become um, more powerful within the Federation. The other one is located in Slovenia, the economic powerhouse, um, which in the 1980s then goes on and kind of drifts into welfare chauvinism, if you will, to some extent. How would your story, I'm sure that, I mean, this is not something you could take out of the book, I guess, but judging from what, what, what you've studied, how would your story look if you studied a factory, say, in Bosnia or in Kosovo even? In the, in the more peripheral regions with um, but in economically peripheral regions with uh, with very different relations to the federal state and with different you know with, where and also um, in regions where where ethnicity played a different role um, perhaps a more pronounced role compared to um, well to Slovenia and and Serbia where I mean you do mention migrant workers from different um, from different Republics, which is a very interesting topic, but still neither Slovenia nor Central Serbia are sort of the main hotspots of um, of ethnic strife at a later stage. So the question would be then, how would this factor and perhaps also in, in other settings? Um, and this relates, I guess, to my second question, which um, you know, if I remember reading about the Yugoslav wars in the um, in the literature and past years, I mean, there was this, um, there was this book by 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 Gagnon on the um, on the myth of ethnic war, which essentially argued that um, that there wasn't much in terms of ethnic mobilization going on in, in Yugoslavia during the wartime, but it was more a matter of demobilizing civil society, which. Um, which had actually started to organize against against the, the party state, whatever. That it was a matter of people like Milosevic and Tudjman in, in the case of Croatia demobilizing this. Um, I wonder where you stand on that, because your narrative kind of seems to be sitting between the poles of that that narrative that you depicted, where where the workers from uh, Rakovica were just sort of the um, I don't know, just the, the, the vanguard of Milosevic's nationalist mobilization. And the counter thesis where this is just a, a chimera, so to speak. So where would you position yourself with this? Thank you. Yeah, excellent, excellent question, Yanis. Thanks. Um, well, yes, I mean, as I said, they are exceptional in the sense um, that right, they were extremely important, and the automotive industry, as you know, the metal industry in most socialist economies were was uh, privileged for uh, uh, many, many decades as the kind of a driver of, of growth. Um, and there was um, you know special attention by the authorities to keep um, self-management um, and political, these so-called social, so social political bodies running inside of them. And for them being, um, you know, um, run by uh, blue collar workers to a large extent. Um, so this makes them kind of, um, you know, perfect for me to, as I mentioned, see the processes which existed in the country as a whole, but in a kind of accumulated uh, way in these, in these uh, two uh, factories. And uh, the story would have been definitely different if I looked in, at factories in, in other um, geographic regions. I have chosen, again, Serbia and Slovenia because of the fact that these were the two uh, republics which were, um, uh, you know, uh, most reform oriented in the 1980s, right? These were uh, the two factories which were engaging mostly against the status quo um, in economic and political sphere uh, inherited from the Tito um, uh, years. Uh, and as such, they opened up space for um, political debate and this reconfiguration of alliances on the factory uh, level. So it is important to point out that, you know, I would say the majority of workers, uh, you know, in these two factories, even, but this, you know, you know, can can um, 
you can apply this to the Yugoslav working class as a whole, had what the party state described as um, the wage earner mentality, meaning that they did not participate in the self-management organs, that they did not engage themselves in uh, political work at the workplace, that they tended to see the factory as you know, a place where they come, they work for eight hours, they take the money and they go back home, right? Um, and as such, uh, you know, the vast majority of them never participated directly in these uh, in these um, 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 discussions, right? Um, so, however, these uh, you know discussions, these uh, clashes that I described through these two uh, factories definitely then proliferated and you know uh, 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 spread. Um, to other workers and throughout the industrial uh, milieus. And uh, I think, you know, I think it, it's, I really warn against, um, you know, e making EMR representative of Serbia and TAM of Slovenia at that time, even though TAM was obviously, you know, a more market oriented um, factory. It uh, had a strong managerial uh, leadership. Uh, it had less influence of political uh, structures. And EMR, as uh, you mentioned, was at the center of political power. It relied more on political um, negotiation with its business partners. However, these, um, you know, uh, sentiments that you notice in TAM, for instance, this, um, you know, um, uh, micro corporatism was widespread all over Yugoslavia, and you know whenever you had a kind of a final producer, which is more market oriented, which is successful, these type of um, you know exclusivist and and narrower interpretations of self management would appear, and you see this in Serbia as well, right? So you could really replicate some of the, uh, for instance, arguments that you would hear in Maribor by the trade union and self-management um, elites when warning against these centralized efforts uh, by the Serbian leadership to overcome the crisis. You could really replicate this in Serbia in relation to Kosovo, for instance, right? With the argumentation used, um, you know, with uh, solidarity transfers and, you know, um, aid given to Kosovo, this slowing down Serbian economy um, and so on. So these tropes, and the, these sentiments, uh, this idea of a bureaucracy was uh, quite common, right? I've seen, you know, colleague Rory Archer is here. We worked a lot together and he looked at the Croatian um, newspapers, factory newspapers in the late 1980s. And, you know, you see continuingly these same tropes of bureaucracy, techno bureaucracy, productive, non-productive work uh, existed more or less everywhere in Yugoslavia. The difference is how are they um, politicized at really concrete uh, historical moment, right? And which uh, forces come to the fore of Republican uh, parties in the late uh, 1980s. So Slovenia and Serbia are an exception in this case. And what I guess you, could, you would see in, in many factories, uh, you know, in um, more, uh, you know, conservative, quote unquote, environments such as Bosnia and Herzegovina at the time, or even Croatia, all the way up to uh, 88, 89, 90, is that all of these um, teams exist, there are these grievances, however, they have no connection, they have nobody, no larger process to connect themselves with, right, and as such, they remain um, encapsulated within uh, the enterprise, right? Um, and in this sense, uh, you know, it is true that, you know, for many of these industrial milieus, what really happens is that the war catches them more or less, um, you know, unprepared. And, you know, there is no previous, you know, mobilization or division along nationalist uh, lines. And you know the reaction and siding with one or the other side is exactly what Gagnon explains in his book. It's you know a, a kind of a, 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 a really fait accompli where you really try to uh, basically preserve your life, right? Uh, uh, there is you know a gun pointed at, at your head at that moment. However, there are these you know cases where um, workers uh, mobilize when there is a strong politicized movement 
And you know, if there is one which you know serves as a kind of a trump card for this idea of you know workers as the vanguard of nationalist politics, it is Rakovica and the MR. And this is exactly why I picked up this case in order to see it from the inside and explained how it came uh, to this uh, ultimate ultimate uh, result. Thank you, Goran. Um, thank you very much. We have um, another question here by our colleague, Janusz Kovac. Janusz, please. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, so if, if one rethinks your, your model of the agony of self-management in Yugoslavia uh, with the help of Hirschman's triad, then you are talking about uh, loyalty and some voice basically um, on the part of the working class, I mean the workers, but you didn't mention exit here. Uh, maybe you write about this in your book, I don't know, but there are many ways of, of exiting this situation. I mean, the impasse. One is uh, escaping into entrepreneurship. Uh, that would be, a, a, I think an important, and definitely there is labor migration, uh, you can, switch from industry to agriculture. There are many things to, uh, to escape from this, uh, this agony. Uh, would you please elaborate on, on this option as well? I mean, exit, not only voice and, uh, and, <clears throat> and loyalty. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Janusz. This is, this is a very important question. And I already, uh, I mentioned this in, in the previous uh, answer to Yanis when I tried to differentiate between, you know, um, these, this core of um, mostly qualified uh, workers who were active in self-management organs, were um, as a rule party members, and um, you know, participated in the, in the factory life, um, had factory flats which allow them to participate after work in kind of um, factory events and political meetings and this larger periphery of uh, workers often referred to as uh, peasant workers which is again a term known to um, most of you who deal, deal with labor in um, social estates um, which uh, was more passive in the sense less qualified less um, equipped uh, uh, in the sense to engage and use this language, you know, highly politicized language of the party state to claim uh, their rights. Um, and which, uh, you know, uh, as I said, viewed factory mostly as a place where they, you know, go spend some time and then return to um, uh, their peasant households, or uh, they dedicate uh, other part of their time in the so-called uh, gray economy, right? So working, uh, moonlighting in the city, uh, doing repair works, having some small um, workshops, uh, and uh, so on. So once the crisis of, um, of socialist modernization in the 1980s um, came, the um, part of industrial workers which was mostly hit was this nucleus of um, you know, uh, skilled workers who uh, had most of their income connected to their employment in a self-managed uh, mm -hmm. factory, right? And for uh, the other part, for a uh, majority of workers, uh, it, you know, it was much more logical to apply the exit strategy, right? So to go back and um, rely on um, you know, um, uh, their peasant household, on raising some uh, you know, food and livestock, uh, or on um, doing extra uh, moonlighting in, in um, the city. So um, ironically, uh, many of uh, workers which were uh, kind of lower paid and had lower, uh, which were positioned lower in the hierarchy within the industrial uh, milieus were then somehow better prepared or less, you know, surprised or caught on guard 
in uh, the transition years in you know 1991 when you know you start you know with the privatization with you know closing of factories and and um, and and so on. So um, yeah, this exit strategy is definitely something which is is highly important and which I um, yeah I, I I describe in, in in a book to 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 a large to a large extent. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to address a question or a comment to Goran at this point? If not, um, I would perhaps treat you to one to one more question that uh, that came up when reading. Uh, the book, or well, at this point, reading the introduction to your book, at least, um, where you say at, at, the, at the very end of the introduction, you say uh, that the, the, your chapter, your like your concluding chapter, concludes by revealing the different ways in which the Serbian and Slovene officials addressed workers' grievances and set the tone for increasingly nationalist charged official public language in the following years, leading to the ultimate breakup of the country. Um, and I'm wondering, is this, are you proposing there a hypothesis on sort of an explanation for the breakup of Yugoslavia as, um, as driven by the way these workers' grievances were addressed in nationalist terms? Or was this nationalist um, framing of these terms just sort of a symptom of, of, a, broader, of a broader nationalist um, mobilization, if you will? Um, so what's, what's, is, is that the root cause that you would propose? Yeah, I, I wouldn't go that far of calling it, you know, a root cause, definitely. But what I do argue is that um, these uh, discussions within the industry were very prominent. They were key uh, part of these discussions, which led to uh, you know the dissolution of Yugoslavia and its final crisis. So, whereas um, you know most of the authors uh, focus on um, you know uh, discussions between um, Republican leaderships in terms of um, you know nationalism, uh, political sphere, uh, and so on. Um, I really show how most of these discussions, uh, you know, were uh, even if they dealt with um, with uh, nation, if they dealt with decentralization, centralization, um, the um, authority that uh, the central state should have, or the you know the different reform attempts, that they were all to a very large extent embedded in the sphere of. Um, of uh, of material production or industry, as I explained, because this idea of uh, industrial work and of workers as the key element of socialism survives all the way up until 1980s, and there is no way of going around it, right? So a lot of discussions and misunderstandings, uh, you know, between the Serbian and the Slovene leadership actually uh, is uh, 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 about uh, goes goes around the question of how to reform self management, right? Um, how to uh, you know uh, uh, bring about uh, you know more efficient production? How to uh, modernize the economy and at the same time uh, keep self management? Uh, and if you keep it, to which to which extent? And how do you, uh, you know, allow for, you know, factories and enterprises which are vastly different in their, as I explained, place within the network of production, their relation to Western markets, and so on. How do you keep a kind of a common frame of reform uh, and who picks up the weight of this uh, transformation? This, this is the key issue, right? So it is often uh, presented as, you know, Serbia versus Slovenia in the sense of Serbia, you know, being more conservative in the, trying to keep the status quo and Slovenia being, you know, more reform oriented and, uh, you know, pro, 
pro-European. Um, at the moment, what I explain by looking at this discussion stemming from the industry, that it is not so much a question of, you know, whether we should reform or not, but how to go on with the reforms, right? So the frustration of um, these managers and, you know, uh, economic chambers in Serbia is not uh, that Slovenia is going down that road. It is why are they leaving us behind, right? Because you know in, they have a kind of a holistic idea of reform for Yugoslavia as a whole, where these you know uh, champions of market um, economy, which are mostly located in the northwestern regions, would pull others behind them and serve as a kind of a buffer for uh, a more thorough market uh, transformation. Once there is you know. A clear picture that you know um, the the managers and uh, uh, you know these these uh, um, politicians in Slovenia are not interested anymore in this type of common um, agenda anymore, and that they orient more towards you know efforts on their own. Uh, you know that each republic and each enterprise uh, finds its own uh, solutions. That's when the backlash starts kind of a frustration and this you know you have you see this eruption of anger and re, re, you know nationalistic uh, tones and the attempt to discipline uh, Slovenia through these these means right so it's this frustration of lagging behind right rather than having opposite opposite um, uh, ideas of what is to be done.